Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction, Paulus. And also, I would like to thank Anton Zetsidatelev, I think, uh, through, through whom the, this was communicated. Uh, so the title of my talk will be Strong Light Matter Coupling from Transition Metal Decalcogenides to Casimir Self-Assembly. As you can see, the title is already pretty broad. And uh, the, the talk today will be like an overview of different uh, projects that we do in my lab. I think I will not have time to cover all of it, but if you're interested in what we are doing, here is a link to our Google Scholar profile or my group web page at Chalmers. You, you can take a look and maybe you'll find something extra interesting. So the many of uh, us, so, so yeah, let me first start with acknowledging uh, the people and the funding. So the work which will be presented today was mainly done by uh, Batuga Munpat, who now is at DTU, Denis Baranov, who is now in Moscow, actually, uh, having his assistant professorship there, a PhD student Adriana Canales, and the post of the two critics. Also, part of what I will be doing actually is now uh, kind of, uh, we are trying to commercialize that while this startup company is menatech.com. If you're interested, you also can take a look. This will be like second part of my talk today. And uh, yeah, so let me start briefly with discussing strong coupling and the menu for today. So I'm pretty sure since we're talking now with polaritonic people, you're all very well aware of what uh, strong coupling is. I will just very briefly tell that this is a generic phenomenon, can be realized in very different systems. And in particular, in a generic structure like that, you can imagine a quantum emitter talking to, uh, to a cavity. And uh, as long as coupling strength is bigger than the dissipation we are talking about, uh, cavity emitters from coupling regime. So this can be realized in plasmonic scenario and in Fabripero scenario. This is what I will talk about in, in the first half. In the second half, I will briefly uh, switch gears and speak about something else, some, uh, so about 2D materials, and in particular about the concept of self-hybridization, a cavity-free concept. In this idea, uh, the cavity and the emitter is kind of consistent of exactly the same material. So, this material can have, for example, very high background index, and that background index leads to formation of optical modes of the system. For example, in a nanodisc, we can speak about me resonances or something like this in such a disk. And then if the same disk supports simultaneously solid state excitations like excitons or phonons, and, and those excitons or phonons are in close proximity, uh, proximity energetically to those geometrical modes, then they can also hybridize and give you some kind of so-called uh, self-hybridization, so polaritons within the same body. This has been, of course, pioneered a long, long time ago by Hopfield in 1958 already. Uh, we are now trying to push this towards uh, nanosystems. Okay, so this is roughly what I will be speaking about. Now let's go through details. In part one, I would like to speak about uh, single small enough plasmonic nanoparticle, yeah? In fact, uh, as Pavlos mentioned, I did my PhD on plasmonics. So we have quite a lot of work, including experimental work on plasmonics, but I decided not to include it uh, to this talk because you can find this kind of published work and there is a lot of it, you're welcome to take a look. Uh, but, but in this work, we really, in collaboration with theoreticians, decided to take a, a little bit deeper look into plasmonic particles and their strong coupling with, with excitons. And for that reason, uh, we, we choose to work with time-dependent DFT theory. And uh, we would like, therefore, to work with small enough structures which uh, can be calculated with TDDFT. So we went here, particularly for the case of aluminum 201 atoms, this is small enough uh, structure to be uh, really calculated by TDDFT, but big enough to support already plasmas. You, you can see that this kind of uh, collective oscillation of uh, conductive electrons here. So the, uh, uh, the plasma in this aluminum particle uh, occurs at around seven and a half electron volts. Now we just have to choose a molecule which resonates in the same range, and this is benzene molecule. Benzene molecule, interestingly enough, resonates at about seven and a half electron volts. So when we mix benzene with aluminum 201, we're obtaining this nice Rabi split in here, uh, but because this has been done with DFT, 
we know exactly how the upper and lower polariton looks like in terms of almost like molecular orbitals. So we can see all these details about this. We also see that polaritons, upper and lower polariton, obey the symmetry rules, symmetric and anti-symmetric configuration of you know, plasmon and exciton around. Uh, there is quite a lot of details in, in this paper uh, which you can read about. I also don't, don't really have time to go through this. Uh, I would say this provides kind of really a lot of details to the system and perhaps can give us some insights to polaritonic chemistry in this strong coupling regime, which is now gaining popularity in the community of people uh, dealing with polaritons. So a little more about the structures. We looked into the strong coupling in DFT uh, also from the perspective of collective effects and particle size effects. So we looked from one benzene molecule to eight benzene molecules and aluminum 201 up to aluminum 1289 uh, clusters. And what we found is that the coupling strength is actually almost linearly proportional to the square root of no number of benzene molecules, the good old uh, tavis Cummings result. So in principle, you don't even need to do the TDDFT for that. Um, but interesting also that uh, the coupling strength for single benzene molecule that we obtained is actually rather high. It's on the order of 200 milli electron volts for a single molecule is kind of a gigantic result, I would say. Nevertheless, in our case, uh, uh, because this, this was of course achieved because uh, the optical mode was confined to such a small, small uh, region in space. And in principle, uh, one could perhaps even reach ultra strong coupling in this case, we don't do this because even though we have 200 MeV, but don't forget that we resonate around seven electron volts. So overall G over omega is not such a big number, but actually a little bit of um, uh, like, a, like a spoiler, we actually now look at, at ultra strong coupling with individual molecules in this uh, type of similar structures where we use a dimer of aluminum particles and then position individual a molecule which fits the resonance of that dimer. And uh, it seems like we can reach ultra coupling with individual molecule, at least theoretically. Okay, so th this was an kind of interesting theoretical detour. Uh, now I would like to switch gears and speak more about uh, Fabri Perot cavities. This, I believe, is something that uh, uh, Paolo, you are doing a lot, and probably the audience are mostly familiar with this Fabri Perot cavities rather than with plasmonics. And uh, I also believe polaritons uh, usually are realized in this regime of collective effect. When you have, let's say, a planar fabricular cavity, a fabricular cavity can be made of DBR mirrors, dielectric mirrors with high Q factors. It can be also done with metallic mirrors with uh, lower Q factors. Uh, but uh, let's say the system looks something like that. Yeah, we, ha we have two mirrors uh, configuration, and then we have some emitters inside. And if we're talking about organic molecules, typically you can uh, reach uh, Rabi splitting on the order of several hundred MeV in principle easily with organics. Something on the order of 300 MeV can be reached. Uh, but uh, then here's an interesting point. Because this is a collective effect, uh, the number of molecules here is very large, but this also gives you so-called, so uh, let's say a freedom in terms of choosing what these molecules could be because these molecules do not have to be exactly the same. It is preferred that these molecules are, say, the same from the optical point of view, but maybe they can be different from a chemical point of view or some other um, uh, ways. Whereas, again, I stress it, optically, they should be very close to each other. But actually, this kind of intermixed systems where you do not have to choose molecules of exactly the same type, this was uh, looked already by Agranovich. Uh, I think it was pioneering work when he looked into intermixed Frank and Vanier mod polaritons, for example. Uh, similar concepts were done in the Litzy group where they looked into donor acceptor inside the cavity, co-hybridization with solvent, which was recently done by Ebison group and many, many others. So what we have done in this work in nano letters, we actually went a little bit even further uh, extreme, so to say, and replaced some of these molecules with the plasmonic particles. These plasmonic particles, their resonance was tuned to the same position where the molecule would resonate. And of course, the oscillator strength of plasmonic particles is much higher than the molecules. So you could reach the same 280 MeV splitting with much smaller number of plasmonic particles. In fact, optically, these kind of two systems are 
so to say, close to identical, but, uh, but uh, their properties in terms of chemistry, in terms of uh, polaritonic uh, dynamics, in terms of excited state dynamics, and so in terms of lazing, of course, things like this that, that, that you guys are doing here, uh, they are most likely very, very different. Yeah, they, they are similar just in the linear regime of, uh, kind of transparency or reflectivity or something like that. And nonetheless, we liked uh, this approach. And in fact, uh, here, instead of molecules, we use two-dimensional materials to realize rather splitting and like pretty high numbers there. So, so I'll show you some examples. So in this case, we see, we look experimentally in the, into this cavity plus plasmonic nanoparticle arrays inside the cavity. And we can easily get rubber splitting on the order of uh, half electron volt. And we can control it by the density of plasmonic particles and in principle can go into much higher coupling strength. All right, so uh, for us, this was this kind of fabric cavity and plasmonic nanostructures was an interesting model system. It's really just, I, I really again stress, it's kind of a model system which allows you to study a lot of things. Uh, and that is because now with the progress in electron beam lithography, you can very easily control the density of particles, their stellar strengths by controlling, let's say, size, dimensions, and so on, uh, symmetry of them. Uh, for example, plasmonic particles don't have to be uh, highly symmetric. They can be chiral, they can be elongated, and so on. So this allows to study quite a lot of uh, interesting things. And here is a collection of stuff that we have done in, uh, in a couple of years from now. Uh, so the first one was ultra strong coupling where we realized here a dense array of plasmonic nanorods and they were placed so densely that uh, the coupling strengths over omega was on the order of 50% actually. So we kind of easily reached ultra strong coupling and we're on the way towards deep strong coupling even with plasmonic particles and proven temperature. This was done by Denis Baranov. I don't know if he's in the audience now, but uh, yeah, he's now in Moscow and I think he continues to work on this. And uh, like recently I heard from him that it's actually possible even to, to, to push it towards deep strong coupling regime, okay? Then we have also looked into uh, arrays of uh, chiral nanoparticles, chiral plasmonic particles between the mirrors. And we saw then the rabbit splitting in circular dichroism of these structures. Now, of course, uh, chiral polaritons were not really possible to realize because the mirrors were not chiral. Nevertheless, this kind of a model system, which allows to start looking into this kind of phenomena. And again, Denis Baranov, who was behind this work, he is trying to push this towards, uh, towards really uh, chiral polaritons with the help of chiral mirrors. And then recently in collaboration with uh, uh, Carl Borison group uh, uh, here in Gothenburg, we pushed the resonance of these plasmonic nanoparticles into uh, infrared regime to realize kind of intermixed vibrational polaritons with molecules inside the cavity and, uh, and those plasmonic particles which were pushed towards the infrared regime. So we could drastically increase the rabbit splitting in the vibra vibropolaritons beyond what can be obtained with molecules. And perhaps this is actually a way to think about uh, vibrational polaritonic chemistry. We're thinking that th this may be a way to explain how it actually functions a little bit, let's say more enhanced in our case than in reality in original Ebison's experiments, but nevertheless, uh, this is a step forward, I believe. Okay, so I, I, gave, you, I gave you quite some examples with the fabric rolls, right? I, I, I think this is maybe a little different from what you traditionally do, uh, but now I would like to discuss something a little bit different. You know, um, for a while, when we were thinking about uh, something like that, let, let me go, go back here. So this uh, structure, yeah, it, it represents uh, two parallel uh, plates of metal, right? It can be DBR in principle. But this problem, of course, is for a type of problem. And uh, when, when you put inside uh, some kind of molecules, you can get strong coupling. But this problem also highly, highly reminds an original Casimir problem. A Casimir problem of quantum electrodynamics where in vacuum, two uncharged plates get attracted to each other, right? So there is like quite some obvious similarity between this and, and uh, Casimir problem. And we were thinking for a while, is it possible somehow to marry then this Casimir problem with polaritonics? 
And there has been several uh, works recently published in Science and Nature by a group of saint jean for example, Federico Capasso and uh, Parsegan, on measuring uh, repulsive Casimir-Lucius forces. Usually Casimir-Lucius forces are attractive. Uh, they were able to realize the repulsive forces uh, here by the use of Teflon and here by the use of the liquid, uh, so-called bromobenzene, which has a very high refractive index, higher than silica. For that reason, they were able to realize repulsive Casimir-Lucius forces. Okay, but we were thinking, okay, maybe we want to stay within a regular attractive casimir lucius forces, but perhaps we could realize something like that, right? Can one prepare these fabric cavities in a simpler way than in the nanofabrication? Can one employ casimir lucius force for this? Because this platform, uh, this fabric platform is a really, uh, really unique and nice platform for creating polaritons, mixtures of light and metal, right? But it requires a clean room facility. It may be hard to fabricate. It, it may be hard to tune also once, once you fabricate it. And it only consists of passive elements. What if instead we will use a pair of gold nanoflakes, which would essentially play a role of two parallel, parallelly oriented mirrors, which just in an aqueous solution would uh, uh, form a, uh, a self-assembled fabricator cavity. And this self-assembly can happen by a balance between attractive casimir lucius force and repulsive electrostatic force, because all those colloidal particles are usually charged. That's the way why they are stabilized. In fact, this is well known through the so-called DLVO theory uh, for colloidal stability. Here, the difference would be that the casimir lucius force requires uh, accurate inclusion of retardation effects. Uh, and, and that's all in principle, right? So th this is how it looked in practice when we first tried, right? Uh, here you can see the uh, joint uh, Casimir electrostatic potential. The uh, electrostatic potential is repulsive and shown in red, and Casimir uh, potential is attractive and shown in yellow green here, yeah? So depending on the salt concentration that we add into solution, and salt here uh, plays a role of uh, essentially, uh, um, uh, a medium which can screen electrostatic interaction. So when we don't have enough salt, the electrostatic interaction is not screened and then it is dominated by electrostatics, right? So we will not have stable configuration. If we add too much salt on the other hand, we, then we screened out completely electrostatic interaction and then Casimir will dominate and we will get into aggregation. This is also well known. If you will add into colloidal solution, a lot of salt, it will immediately aggregate. But if you just add enough salt, then you will, nicely equilibrate between um, attraction and repulsion, and you will get the stable equilibrium at around 120 nanometers, which is long enough to form a Bripero in the visible range. So that's pretty cool. Okay, how this looks in reality. Well, at first we positioned it on a gold film and with a movable uh, top uh, flake, which, uh, which was diffusing in water solution. So when we didn't add enough salt, the flakes sort of danced around uh, the bottom mirror, giving you all these beautiful colors, uh, but essentially it was not stable because electrostatic was dominating the city. Okay, so this not this kind of looks nice, but it's uh, like a nano discotheque or something like this. Something happens, a lot of colors, but it's not maybe very useful for uh, as a cavity. Now, if you add too much of salt, uh, the flake really sticks to the bottom mirror. Actually. I'm not sure if it really sticks, you know, probably the distance that we can get between the flake and uh, the bottom mirror can be on the order even 10 nanometers or so. So it can be really a nano cavity formed there. It looks black because it's sort of not transparent any longer and it doesn't diffuse much because it's uh, very close. Okay, so this is like an aggregation, but then let's just add enough salt. So if we add just enough salt, we can turn this color into red and it's relatively stable, right? This means on the other 150 nanometers in separation distance. If we add a bit more salt, then it turns into green and it, it even diffuses less than because it's even closer to the surface. It's actually a very nice platform, it seems, at room temperature, but by just changing salt concentration, we can form a self-assembled structure here, yeah? And can nicely control its color and actually it becomes very stable after that. But uh, then something even more interesting, I would say, happened because uh, it turned out that this gold film that we used originally, we didn't really need this. For example, we 
started to shrink the size of this gold film and it actually didn't lead to anything. Uh, the flakes still liked to go to the local area where we had this gold film and park, so to say, there having these nice colors. But then even, even more interesting thing happened. Actually, it turns out that you don't need this gold film at all because what could happen if one such flake would need another such flake? Well, then they could start playing the role of you know, two mirrors and they would actually keep uh, each other together really in a self-assembled manner. So this is what happened here. Yeah, I'll just run the movie. So in this case, you see a bottom flake and the top flake, they found each other. Once they found each other, they moved together as one, but not really aggregated. And then we look into the resonance. It gives resonance in the visible range. We, when we measure dispersion, it gives the usual parabolic dispersion. It's very easy to make. In fact, you don't have to do anything. You just mix a colloidal solution of flakes and you wait until they find each other. So they are self-assembled. It's possible to actively tune by light um, pressure and by salt concentration. And here we show that by changing salt concentration, we can tune it all the way from 80 nanometers to 160 nanometers. For example, this was done by salt, purely by salt. And, but once they find each other, they're really stable horizontally and vertically for weeks. Really, it, it's like a pretty amazing platform. So the next question you could ask is, okay, it's nice, it's self-assembled, blah, blah. What about polaritons? Can you use that uh, for polaritons? And I think we can. Uh, the easiest way to think about polaritons in this case was actually to form so-called a trivial polariton consisting of a trimer of th three mirrors here, one, two, three. So here, the middle mirror is semi-transparent and plays a role of uh, interaction mediator, so to say. If this mirror is completely not transparent, then these two cavities do not interact at all with each other. And then you will get this, uh, just a simple reflection deep here. If the transmission of the middle mirror is fully transparent, then you will get uh, the first order and second order for Pripyrov between topmost and uh, bottommost uh, mirrors here. But if the middle mirror is semi-transparent, then you get this kind of kind of Rabi splitting like polaritonic situation, which is a symmetric and anti-symmetric combination of these cavity modes in top and the, and the bottom here. And it turns out that when we ex in experiment look at it, the, the splitting that we obtain here is on the order what we get for a middle thickness of about 25, 30 nanometers. So from here, we can conclude that the thickness of the middle mirror is on the order of 30 to 25 nanometers because experimental theory agrees. And also, then we have checked with atomic uh, force microscopy the uh, typical thickness of our uh, mirrors, and they turned out to be on the order of 30 nanometers. So it's pretty valid. Yeah. But then we went even further and actually really positioned a two dimensional material in between a movable mirror and non movable gold film here. Okay. This particular platform was possible to modulate actually with a few hertz by a driving laser over here. We have first modulated an empty Fabripera cavity. It was nicely modulated here. Uh, the uh, spectral range we could modulate. Actually, the cavity thickness was all the way from 140 to 200 nanometers modulated by light. In fact, when it was not modulated, the standard deviation displacement of thickness was on the order of two nanometers, actually very small. So it's a very stable, even at room temperature, very nice system seemingly. Now, when we position WSE2 in the middle, we, we get polaritons between excitons and WS2 and the self-assembled fabricator structure here. But when we start driving this now with the uh, with a movable laser, with a tunable laser here, we can move the system actually completely in and out of strong coupling because the detuning that we get uh, can get is higher than the coupling. So actually, if you look at the upper polariton fractions, for example, sometimes we can get zero and one in exciton and photon which means that we tune out the system out of strong coupling regime at will. So this is kind of nice. We think we, we have a very nice platform here, which allows to do a lot of things in, in liquid at uh, room temperature by controlling salt with light and so on. A lot of ways to modulate this, perhaps to marry this with optomechanics. And interestingly, the most interesting direction for us at the moment, we are trying to think about again, polaritonic chemistry. I think that polaritonic chemistry is done at room temperature in vacuum, I mean, in electromagnetic vacuum from the point of view that there is no light. 
so in darkness, this perhaps is an interesting platform for this regime because it actually forms again in darkness. You don't need to do anything. It just forms itself and then perhaps can steer chemical reactions. Uh, so this was recently uh, uh, published in Nature last year. Uh, yeah, we, we think this could be an interesting platform for polaritonics, for, for several future polaritonic uh, directions. Okay, so with this, I think I'm done with fabri Perros and uh, with, um, uh, with plasmonics. Let us now discuss a little bit the third part, the cell coupling. And here we choose to work with two-dimensional materials because they have really high oscillator strengths. And uh, I think monolayers of PMDs are very well known now for their excellent excitonic properties. A lot of people work just on that. Uh, we worked also a bit on strong coupling between plasmons and, uh, and uh, excitons in those materials. But then uh, we also shifted our attention towards multilayers. In fact, multilayers are also interesting. And uh, Jeremy Baumberg uh, showed already in, this, in his uh, cavity on, on mirror that he can couple to, to multilayers. We also work with multilayers and individual plasmonic structures in our group. And um, what I have to say is that the beauty of TMD material is not only excitons. I think this is uh, relatively well known. But perhaps something which is less known is that this uh, TMD materials have extremely high background refractive index. So let me show you what happens there. Um, actually, this extremely high refractive index brings you, uh, gives you n bigger than four in the visible range. n bigger than four is out competing silicon and gallium arsenide, actually. Okay. And there is a whole community which is working on high index dielectrics for meta surfaces and stuff like this, right? So I would say this TMD is actually out competing this, at least for the in plane components. Now it's also very anisotropic because the uh, contrast between parallel and perpendicular refractive index in these materials, and they are naturally anisotropic because of Van der Waals nature of, of, of uh, these structures. It can be bigger than 1.5. In fact, it's very high, especially for the naturally occurring system. So this can lead to high index TMD nanophotonics in general. One could produce nanophotonic elements out of this TMD multilayers. And uh, for the interest of the talk uh, of this talk, this can also lead to cavity-free polaritons, which means a uh, kind of a mixture between an optical mode confined by the material itself and say excitons in this material. So this has been pioneered by Holtfield already in 1958 in his uh, physical review paper, where he looked into bulk polaritons, right? Very famous work from, from the, and uh, yeah, Holtfield uh, Hamiltonian also went out of there. What we've done here is that it turns out that if you just take a slab uh, or a thin film of this, uh, of this TMDC material, you can get self-hybridization in this film between the Fabripera mode over here and uh, excitons in the same material. And then we have also recently realized um, a similar concept of hybridization between mean modes in the, in the nanodisk of such a structure and excitons in, in the same nanodisk, okay? That actually really shows to be uh, possible. Uh, maybe a little more about this specific situation, self-hybridization in TMD flakes. Uh, so the question could be, can, can, do we really need a cavity, so to say? To, to form polaritons. Uh, in the first uh, half of the talk, I was arguing that yes, we need, but actually in some situations, for example, here, you can consider a slab of this TMDC material just in vacuum with refractive indices one above and below the slab. But because the uh, refractive index of the material is very high above four, then you can actually form a fabri uh, mode here. The quality factor of that fabri mode is not high, uh, not high. In, uh, not, not very high, let's say, but it is high enough to be hybridized with excitons in the same material because excitons have very high oscillator strings. So what happens then, if you bring this cavity mode just by playing with the thickness of the material, uh, you can bring in this cavity mode to overlap with the exciton at around two electron volts. And when this happens, you get really nice coupling. Actually, you get a splitting between this fabriper mode in the cavity and the exciton in the same material. So all you need is just a slab. Uh, this was realized experimentally. So when we started with really thin materials, uh, just about 10, 20 nanometers, then this fabriper mode was shifted 
too much to the blue from the exciton and we saw uh, no interest in dispersion. This is actually dispersion plot. So energy on the x-axis, you have an angle. You see that all the plots are flat. Uh, this is, and uh, they, they correspond to excitons. But when we uh, switch to thicker flakes, 68, 70, 80 nanometers in those WS2, WSE2, uh, molybdenum S2, and so on, we then shifted this Fabripen mode to really overlap with excitons. And when we do that, we reconstruct this nice parabolic dispersion as you have in typical fabry uh polaritons uh, with a Rabi splitting on the order of uh, 200 MeV. And that uh, Rabi splitting is actually approaching so-called bulk polariton splitting, which is a maximum splitting you can get from, from that material. So that's kind of interesting. The only problem was that uh, the cavity here was rather bad, I would say. So it was not uh, really reaching strong coupling condition, but it was on the way towards it. Nevertheless, you see this kind of uh, tells you maybe the, the flavor of what's going on, uh, what can happen with materials with high refractive indexes. They can, uh, they can create optical modes and then hybridize that with their own uh, resonances, material resonances. So here then uh, I'd like to a little bit uh, tell you a bit more about this self-hybridization and TMDC materials uh, because in attempts to increase the quality factor of, uh, of these modes, we were trying to um, actually make photonic crystals out of TMDs. So in doing so, let's say we start again with a slab of TMD, then we fabricate a nano pattern with, with a holes, circular holes inside this material in order to seek for a photonic crystal effect, which is actually possible. But uh, then something unexpected happened uh, as usual in experiments, you know, in particular in nanoscience, when we were trying to get rid of the resist, uh, which was used, of course, in this EBL process, we were trying to dissolve it with, with an etcher. Unfortunately, or fortunately, actually, for us, this etcher did not dissolve. It is not only dissolved this kind of resist, but it also deformed our holes. So original holes hole were round. But just after a few uh, minutes of interaction with this anisotropic wet etching, our circular holes turned into hexagonal holes. We thought this is crazy at first, how this is possible. Th then it turned out that actually this etching is attacking the edges of this material, of TMDC material in such a way that it actually dissolves the, um, the unwanted edges, so unstable edges, and leaves only the most stable edges. These stable edges turns out to be zigzag edges. So this hexagon essentially contains only zigzag edges. It's kind of self-limiting process. You really eat out all the bad edges and you leave only good these zigzag edges, which are really nice. And these zigzag edges are actually catalytically active. They are metallic and ferromagnetic, predicted from first principles calculations. So they're actually quite interesting. And then in our case, what turned out is that these atomically sharp zigzag edges, they are really undamaged and really close to atomically flat. So this was done with a high resolution transmission electron microscope. The edge here is close to atomically flat. And uh, uh, when we recorded electron energy loss spectroscopy, we could see A, B, C excitons just nanometers inside the material, which means that the edge is really high quality and the, the excitons are undamaged. It's, I would say, really beautiful. Uh, this is what we actually tried to patent uh, this, um, this technology on producing this, and then trying to apply this to, to optics and other things. So for example, this is what we can do. It turns out that um, we can get really nice nanostructured TMD arrays with atomically sharp edges, okay? So these are these photonic crystals that I told you about. Uh, we can really play games with these photonic crystals, but in these photonic crystals, we can simultaneously have atomically sharp zigzag edges all over the surface. So this works over large areas, it's super reproducible, it's very, very simple. Uh, this uh, wet chemistry process which does this is as stupid as hydrogen peroxide, okay? You can just go to apotheket, uh, buy, uh, buy this hydrogen peroxide solution which people use to, to bleach their hairs and you'll get this, okay? It works in a wide parameter range, it gives you a new degree of freedom of control in array lattice versus crystal lattice. So you can get here, say, honeycomb lattices, vortices, or uh, this kind of bow tie type of edges. 
You can also get really non-structured TMDs with ultra narrow features. So let's say when two hexagons meet each other, we can get here a nano ribbon or a nano junction in this case, whose dimension is close to three nanometers. Three nanometers is already close to the, uh, to the uh, 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 bore radius of the exciton in this material, which means you can get quantum size effects. And it's actually really hard to get structures like this with a technology different from ours, I would say. Nanotechnology is very hard to get. Uh, so currently this is actually limited by E-beam lithography. Perhaps this can be improved even further than, so this was published recently. And actually for the, from the optical point of view, it's also nice because this nanostructure TMV is a very colorful. They have excellent nanophotonic properties because of this very high refractive index, bigger than four and very anisotropic index. The, the color that you get can be all the way from blue, green, yellow to red over the entire spectral, uh, visible spectral range. So you get this actually polaritonic arrays in this case, you see, depending on the distance between the hexagons, you can get different spectra and you uh, can see even how these modes are trying to cross the exciton here at two electron volts and they don't. And you see this anti-crossing on the order of 200 uh, milli electron volt again, approaching again this bulk rabbit split. Okay, so this was interesting. And that's where we formed this startup company. Perhaps this could be interesting for, for some of you. This is actually commercially available now. Uh, okay. Then uh, after a while, we were thinking, okay, this self-hybridization approach is kind of trivial, right? This has been discovered by Hopfield long time ago. Uh, yeah, we realize it in TMDCs, but maybe this is not limited to TMDCs. It is actually Lawrence model on which it was built, right? So there are many materials with strong transitions, which you can find in nature. And uh, there are also many materials with high enough background refractive index, which you can find in nature. Uh, what is, you know, the most simple situation that you can imagine in nature, we were thinking. And it turns out, actually, interestingly enough, that inside clouds, you get uh, water droplets, right? And those water droplets, actually, uh, again, self-assembled, you, you get water droplets of roughly this size. It turns out that the size range inside the cloud is on the order of 10 micrometers, 10, 20 micrometers, somewhere there. 10, 20 micrometers of water droplet in air, it's a good enough me resonator or whispering gallery mode resonator. In fact, it supports quite high quality modes. And then you can imagine that those high quality modes can be tuned to the position of phonons inside water. And water is uh, as a very well known greenhouse gas. Of course, it absorbs in the, in the mid AR. So in particular at three microns, you have a very strong absorption of, of the water stretching mode, symmetric stretching mode. So there is a good chance that that mode can overlap with the me modes or whisper and gallery modes and actually form this uh, bulk polaritons in water. Perhaps this could be interesting for something. Yeah, and in, in fact, uh, in clouds and steams, you, you really don't have to do much in order to get this 10 micron uh, size drops because smaller drops, uh, they are not stable because of diffusion. They diffuse very fast and they meet each other and they coalesce uh, into a bigger one. A droplets bigger than 10 microns, they are too heavy, so they start falling as, a, as, a, as rain, okay? But 10 micron droplets, they, these are exactly the bottleneck. They are not too big to be affected by gravity and they are not too small to be affected by diffusion. So it's actually a really interesting regime. 10 microns is really like, like a sweet spot and uh, like interestingly enough for self fertilization concept, there's also a, a sweet spot in size for having uh, this um, uh, high quality mere resonances and self hybridization. So let me give you uh, some background here. So water has very high oscillator strengths in mid AR. Water droplets can support me modes, size range in a few microns. Uh, this exists naturally in clouds. And this vibrational me self hybridized polariton can actually even reach ultra strong coupling regime because water, water's absorption is very, very intense. It has very high uh, oscillator strength. So what we've done here technically, we search for polariton eigenmodes in the complex frequency plane as roots of dispersion relations, depending on uh, different scenarios that we get. This is how it looks in the complex frequency plane. This, uh, this was anti-crossing between the roots. So this show upper and lower polariton impact depending on the K. 
uh, for a material uh, platform, we just used the uh, uh, Lorentz model with the background permittivity and uh, some just a single isotropic Lorentz resonance with its uh, uh, with its frequency, uh, resonance frequency and oscillator strengths, and also plasma frequency. And this already this model allows you to study a lot of stuff. So, for example, for bulk polarizons to reproduce Hopfield, we could get this weak coupling, strong coupling, and even ultra strong coupling regime, depending on the parameters of your Lorentz model. And in this case, uh, the dispersion relation is described like this. Uh, all the details are provided in this paper, JCP uh, last year by Adriana Canales. Uh, sorry. When we go to Lawrence labs, uh, as I already discussed for TMDC materials, uh, we can realize it both above and uh, below uh, the, um, uh, the light cone here. So for guided modes and for, for leaky modes here in slabs for J aggregates, for example, for TMDC materials, the same can be realized in cylinders. For example, you can take a perovskite cylinder and the modes of the cylinder can couple to uh, excitons, say, in this uh, perovskite material, again, above and below the light line. So they are fully polaritonic. And finally, when you do it with a water droplet, you can get uh, me modes or whisper and gallery modes coupled uh, to water vibration here at 0 0.42 uh, uh, electron volts or three microns. And if you actually look into the uh, extinction spectrum as a function of radius and frequency, you get this kind of nice anti-crossing around, uh, around three microns. So essentially what it means is that polaritons are everywhere around us, even in clouds, right? So polaritonics is not just, you know, Fabri Perot and inside there you have something high quality. It, it could be everywhere, right? I, including in clouds. The maximum coupling strength that you can get is actually not dependent on the cavity. It's dependent on the material itself. And it's easy to estimate this G bulk. It's just given by parameters of this Lorentz model, plasma frequency, a square root of F divided by the uh, epsilon infinity. In fact, uh, sometimes I get questions from people who would like to uh, check whether this or that material is suitable for strong coupling. Uh, I would say, the best way is to use this formula to estimate uh, the, uh, uh, the bulk the bulk is splitting. Beyond that, you anyway cannot go. And then um, these bulk polariton effects are also intrinsically collective, right? Uh, in all of these scenarios, in slabs, cylinders, spheres, you all the time need a large number of excitations, which is evenly distributed across the whole body of these materials. So actually the question which I'm trying to understand now is going towards, do these polaritonic states, this kind of natural polaritonic states, do they play any role in polaritonic chemistry, oxygen transport or other cavity related phenomena actually? I don't know about lasing, probably for lasing they are a bit too dirty. They, they, they are too multi-mode, so to say, for, for beautiful lasing or, or, or condensation phenomena. But for other phenomena, which are now gaining popularity in the community, especially polaritonic chemistry, I'm not so, I'm not so certain that these polaritons, say, in water spheres are totally useless for that. It, it, it could be that, you know, me molds allow you to enhance, actually, electromagnetic field inside, just like a regular cavity. So perhaps th this is a way towards some understanding there. And I, I really would like to, to learn more myself there. So with this, uh, I would like to summarize and say that uh, I have introduced here cavity and cavity-free concepts. In the cavity concept, we have discussed DFT with aluminum clusters. We looked into ultra-strong coupling between plasmonic particles and fabric row, and even self-assembly, uh, Casimir self-assembly. In the cavity-free domain, we looked into slabs, uh, knee resonators, uh, arrays of edges, and even water droplets. All of this is polaritons, and I think, uh, Polaritonics uh, is great. Yeah, I would be very happy uh, to hear any questions. So again, uh, I would like to acknowledge the people who did uh, the work, the finding managers, and again, uh, this uh, this company. Thank you very much for your attention. <coughs> Timur, thank you very much for this really, I mean, wonderful, wonderful results that you you presented here uh, for us today. Very impressive. So I will try to. 
guide the discussion now. Uh, so if there are any questions, please uh, raise your hand. So uh, we have the first question here from, I can only see DAB, so. Yeah, sorry, it's, it's, my, it's my weird uh, way of writing. I don't know why Zoom is writing it in this way. Okay. Hi, my name is Dennis Vanderen, and uh, yeah, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Uh, I've got a short question regarding your chemical method of patterning TMDC. Like it's, it's absolutely fantastic. I've never seen anything like that. How universal is this method? Uh, is it, does it work only for like semiconducting TMDC or it's like universal and you tried many other crystals as well? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, this is a wonderful question. I, of course, we tried, um, yeah, uh, I would say like this, we tried several semiconducting TMDs. For some of them, it works. For some, it doesn't, unfortunately. I think it is, uh, um, of course, given by the chemistry of uh, the edge, uh, relative stability of the edge with respect to the oxidation agent that you're using. And in our case, as I told you, it was uh, hydrogen peroxide. So materials for which it works is molybdenum disulfide, MOS2, tungsten disulfide, and uh, molybdenum selenide. Molybdenum, yeah, molybdenum diselenide. Okay. Well, for tungsten selenide, it doesn't work. We, we have tried, it is too aggressive. It removes all of it, including the, uh, the zigzag edges. For metallic TNDs, we have tried tantalum S2, niobium SE2, niobium S2. Unfortunately, it's also not universal. The way it works, at least this particular chemical, it actually etches the opposite way. It etches against the, um, the uh, what is it called? Uh, it etches against the plane, against the basal plane, okay? So when you introduce it against our etchant, it, you start reducing the number of layers in your multi-layer uh, material, whereas the edges are not so much affected. In this effect, when, when we're talking about semiconductors, in particular WS2, there we even tried bilayer. Bilayer remains bilayer. So, so the uh, basal plane is extremely stable. The, the zigzag edges are extremely stable. Nothing happens to them, but, uh, but armchair edges are immediately destroyed, more or less. So it's kind of a self-limiting process, uh, which works nicely for mainly MOS2 and WS2, I would say like that. It is not universal. I would maybe guess that if you go from hydrogen peroxide to something else, maybe you can try to find a specific chemical for for, for TMD material of your choice. However, this is just the beginning. So perhaps chemist or I don't know, DFT people can say something about this. I see. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, next we have Tamsin Kukson from uh, Skoltek. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for a uh, very nice talk. My, my first question was actually on uh, the same topic. I was wondering how small or large, you can etch these circles that then get turned into hexagonal structures before it stops working. Right, so the smallest uh, hexagons that we tried uh, in, in diameter were on the order of 20 nanometers, okay? So the even smaller ones, I think it will be a bit of a challenge, both from the E-beam point of view and from uh, maybe etching point of view. On the other hand side, when we went to the very big hexagons, I mean, we tried up to 20 microns, it still works. So 20 micron holes can be still uh, turned into hexagons. You just need to wait significantly longer times until this self-limiting process for 20 micron hexagons uh, finishes. So roughly like this range, 20 nanometers to 20 microns. It's pretty large range. And uh, yeah. you can more or less choose whatever. I would say, say 50 and 60 will be different, definitely different uh, in, in your result. Uh, maybe here, just to, to again, uh, highlight uh, something which I forgot to say. So you, one may also, also ask a question, how does it work in terms of thickness? So we have tried all the way from monolayers to, to multi-layers up to maybe half micron or so. Interestingly enough, the method works for any thickness down to bilayer, but with monolayer, it doesn't. 
So you, there is something strange about monolayers. Monolayers are etched not into hexagons, they are etched into triangles, and those triangles are not of high quality for some reason. So those hexagons are much, much more interesting in quality and much, much higher quality than what you get in monolayers. And by the way, maybe this is also for people who work with TMDs, you know, this is kind of a lesson learned hard for me, so to say, because majority of people who work with TMDs now, I would say maybe 90% or so, they are actually working with monolayer TMDs. If we were working with monolayer TMDs, just like everybody else, we would never discover this process. So it only works with multi-layers for some reason. Probably we speculate that this is because of this AB stacking. So the typical stacking for those multi-layers is AB. And if a monolayer is etched into a triangle, then an AB stacking will, will turn into triangle and triangle rotated 180 degrees and so on. And when you do that, the overlap of two triangles rotated by 180 degrees gives, gives you actually a hexagon. That's probably the reason for, for this hexagon. Thank you very much. My other question was on, I think, slide 14. It was on the Casimir uh, cavities. I, back uh, 14, I think, um, on the number. Yes, this one. So in uh, figure C, what, can I ask why the displacement of L cav isn't even about the undisplaced, uh, unmodulated green line for the red and the black, the, the low and medium powers of the laser? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not really sure. I, I think, um, uh, yeah, what I could argue for, to answer this question, you probably need to go to this potential, yeah? So <laughs> this potential is, as you can see, is maybe harmonic approximation to this potential can be applied very, um, so to say, shallowly, I, I, I would say. It, 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 in other words, this potential is not harmonic. If you look at it, it is much, much stiffer on the blue side than it is on the red side. So if you start also, if you start driving this thing, it will be unharmonic, unfortunately. And uh, this is probably the reason behind, uh, behind what you see, yeah. And uh, to follow up that question, I was wondering if you change the modulation lasers wavelength, uh, how the displacement varies uh, in the terms of if you were to want to head towards <laughs> condensation or lasing, having a laser that modulates your cavity would obviously be a disadvantage. So is there a wavelength that you're aware of or that will not modulate your cavity, but instead excite your TMDs inside only? Right, I, I, I think uh, you need to, uh, well, the, the physical reason for modulation here is light pressure and uh, light pressure can be, uh, so, so to say, of two types, absorbing type and reflecting type. As long as you find a spectral range in, in which your laser is neither, neither, let's say, neither absorbing nor, nor reflecting, for gold, it's very hard to find something like this, but maybe for DBR mirrors, it, it would be possible, uh, then uh, you, you can consider uh, use it rather for excitation of material inside the cavity, but not for, but, 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 but not for optomechanical drive of the cavity. Otherwise, you will have to select a wavelength which would then be either absorbed inside the mirror or reflected by the mirror. Then you would be able to, to, to tune it, to oscillate it. Uh, we have not tried anything uh, different than 455 nanometer, actually, but uh, gold doesn't have a particularly interest in the electric function, uh, I would say. You, you know, probably you will have much more interest there if you would go to a DBR version of the same, which I think, by the way, would be possible. Uh, this would be possible, actually, even, even on the uh, fabrication level, yeah? Uh, maybe another point here, I would like to stress that because this process is done in water, then you need to move large amounts of water up and down when you do this. This limits the frequency of uh, mechanical oscillation of this system to just a few hertz, unfortunately. So for example, you cannot drive this system with kilohertz and megahertz, that's, that's crazy. Uh, it's a uh, mechanical system does not support that. But a few hertz up to 15, I think we tried, that works. Yeah. 
Thank you very much, Linda. Thank you for the great talk. Thank you, Guillaume. Yes, uh, hello, I'm Guillaume Malpech from Clermont-Ferrand. Thank you for a very nice talk. Uh, I had a small question about TMD uh, multi-layers because I had the feeling that uh, they are actually uh, indirect uh, band gap semiconductors. Yes. So, uh, so here there is no, I mean, it's not a Van der Waals heterostructure with, I don't know, HBN between uh, layers. It's really bulk material, mm -hmm. indirect band gap, but at the end of the day, you, you, you see some electronic resonances coupling to the guiding mode, mm -hmm. yes? Or yes. to the mode, the photonic mode. Yes, that's correct. Uh, I would say um, the consequence of indirect band gap in this material is not that you can't see polaritons, but uh, a consequence is that you can't see emission because of the indirect band gap, the emission quantum yield of emission is zero, essentially. But the oscillator strength for absorption process is still not zero. And uh, yeah, it is much lower than for the monolayer. The monolayer per atom, if you would talk to a uh, per layer, would have a higher oscillator strength because of the direct band gap. But when you go to the indirect band gap, you still can have absorption, but uh, that absorption is accompanied by immediate displacement in the, in the K-space, and then you cannot emit backwards. Yes? So that's, uh, as I understand the problem. Polaritons, it seems like experimentally we still see. For example, this is... Um, an illustrative, an illustration from that, but nothing like um, lasing or nothing like even photoluminescence or nothing like condensates can be observed. On the other hand, let me just give you one example where this might work. Uh, so those uh, cylinders made of perovskites, perovskites can simultaneously have high oscillator strengths in the bulk and relatively high refractive index. So people can make those you know, whiskers or wires of or nanocylinders of perovskites, which can be simultaneously in the uh, strong coupling regime and uh, combined with emission. I think there is several groups which are trying to say that these structures can lead to polaritonic lasing and even to condensates. I'm not sure how really valid it is because of um, very, uh, so to say, multi-modeness of the system. I think maybe, maybe you know even better, uh, uh, probably, yeah, I'm sure you, you, you know this uh, field better, better than me. Uh, but uh, uh, coming back to the beginning of your question, I think the only system out of what I have presented could be useful for this is, is this kind of perovskites, yeah? But not TMDs, multi-layers, yeah, definitely not. They are just interesting for me as such, so to say, but outside of uh, their emission. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for, for, for your answer and for the very beautiful talk again. <laughs> thank you. Okay. okay, so we also have a question from Simone Deliberato from Southampton. Mm -hmm. uh, hello. Um, hi, Timur. Aleri, thank you hi. very much uh, for the really great talk. It was, it was a pleasure to see all your great results. I have uh, uh, a question uh, about uh, the um, Casimir self-assembly. Maybe you already partially answered uh, um, before, but uh, can you do optomechanics with those things? Yeah, optomechanics, uh, as I said, uh, it, it, it would be interesting. I, I can maybe comment on what type of optomechanics we can do. So uh, as I was answering the previous question, uh, we can do here optomechanics on a range of few tens of hertz, perhaps, because this is done in water. Vertical displacement of, um, of such uh, structures in water is heavy because you have to move large amounts of water. And this is essentially increases your effective mass of, of, of the optomechanical oscillator, reduces your resonance frequency substantially. Now, but it might be possible, first of all, to realize this system perhaps in vacuum. We were thinking uh, how to do this and it might be possible. Dennis is now working on uh, realizing the same uh, potential in vacuum. It would require, uh, let's say some smart, some smart uh, uh, 
some smart thinking on how, what to do with electrostatics. Electrostatics is a, is a, is a common problem in Casimir work and it, all experimental work with Casimir somehow have to fight against electrostatics, suppress it in some way. Uh, but, but nevertheless, if you would do that in vacuum, and let's suppose it's possible to suppress electrostatics, I, I think it might be po possible technically by um, introducing some, uh, some dielectric spacers. Probably it would be possible and te technically could be possible. Then uh, the uh, optomechanics can go to several tens of kilohertz or maybe even hundreds of kilohertz, yeah? Still not sure if this is interesting enough, but this is definitely more interesting than a few hertz, a few tens of hertz. Now, if you consider uh, optomechanics inside water solution still, which we can do right now, here also something can, can be done, I believe. So for example, if you look at this um, self-assembled structure, you see that very typical shape of these um, objects is not a circle or something like this. It, it, it's a triangle for instance. And what we were recently thinking about is that if you would illuminate at normal incidence a circularly polarized light on such a structure inside water solution, it would be possible to rotate it, actually. And the rotation can be done much, much faster than uh, mechanical uh, motion up and down because rotation is actually done against the very thinnest yeah, part yeah. Of, yeah. Of, the, of the flake, which is only 30 nanometers. So I believe this type of optomechanics, rotational optomechanics, you could imagine a situation when a gain medium, for example, would have a size which would partially go outside of this triangle, if you see what I mean. Then by this uh, fast rotation, you could rapidly switch on and off, on and off, on and off strong coupling, or perhaps even ultra strong coupling at the edge of this uh, triangle, okay? And this could be done rather fast, I believe. Okay, Nevertheless, so. it's still extremely far from uh, from uh, dynamical Casimir effect and stuff like this. So, uh, sorry, optomechanics of that sort is impossible, I think. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. It was just that uh, it, uh, the idea of having this uh, nano, nano accordion seem uh, it, it could still be probably an, an interesting platform. Anyway, thank you very much for your answer. And again, thank you for the awesome talk. Thank you, Simone. <clears throat> we have a next question from uh, Sailendra. Oh. Oh, yeah, hi, I'm Sailendra from Aisar Pune, India. Uh, and so, like, my question is like the same that, like, when you are changing the salt concentration, how the color is changing, first thing, and does like uh, since the changing the color, uh, changing the salt concentration will change the electrostatic says probably it will affect the distance between two plates and all uh, it yes, will yes. also like change the resonances like uh, i mean reflectivity yes. so yeah, yeah. yes exactly uh, th that's exactly the good point so what you change by salt concentration is essentially the debye huckel screening length uh, that's the way you screen out electrostatic interaction the yes. more salt you add the, the, the less pronounced is the uh, electrostatic interaction because you suppress it by the double layer formation close to the, uh, close to the surface. Uh, yes, so, so basically the color changes mostly due to this effect. You affect electrostatics, but you do not so much affect um, uh, Casimir interaction. Casimir interaction is relatively insensitive to salt concentration, I would say. There is still an effect even on Casimir interaction because the refractive index of water uh, is dependent on salt concentration. It's not super significantly dependent on this, but it is dependent on this. I think this is what you refer to. So the change in the refractive index of salty water concentration will also lead to a change in the Casimir effect, but this effect is minor, I would say, in comparison to, to screening of electrostatic interaction. Uh, the change in the refractive index also will change the color of the uh, of the uh, Fabry-Perot resonance. Uh, but again, this change is relatively minor in comparison to the actual distance change, which you get because of the uh, electrostatic repulsion suppression uh, due to addition of salt. That would be my answer. So the main physical uh, mechanism is screen screening of electrostatic interaction. The next uh, level 
of details is a refractive index of water dependent on salt concentration. I agree with that. And we even tried to include it in the model, but it doesn't seem to be a major effect. It is there, definitely. But uh, if you would compare electrostatics versus this effect, electrostatics is more important. Thank you. OK. <clears throat> So it appears that, thank you, it appears that we don't have any more questions. So Timu, I wanted to thank you again for really giving us the pleasure <laughs> to attend this beautiful range of work that you have been doing the last years. It is really very impressive. And thank all of you guys for joining us today. Uh, so we will be here, the next announcement for the next talk will come up. Uh, and uh, Timu, maybe we can, uh, we, can, we, can, we, can, we can schedule actually to meet and discuss potential work where we put uh, light emissive semiconductors inside your structures, because as you know, we are very much inter interested in the nonlinear properties, yes? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely, it would be a pleasure for me. I, I think I have a, a range of points to offer actually there, because it seems like, as I briefly mentioned, it seems like this platform can be realized with DBRs, for example. Yeah, exactly. you, you gave it away, yes. <laughs> All right, so I'll contact you. So thank you very much, everyone, and have a very good day. Thank you, Timur, again. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for inviting me. Bye-bye.